What's going on, guys? This is Fernie with Dad Lives Matter, your host. Uh, we got a special guest tonight's episode. This is our little brother, uh, Jimmy. <laughs> He's the last one out of the crew. He is a cherry on top. Uh, this dude is awesome, man. He's got a very inspiring story. He's uh, definitely been through a lot for his age. Uh, we're super excited to have him on this episode as well as to have him on the team uh, with us. Again, he, he's the youngest one of the crew. He's our cherry on top of the team. Uh, that sounds a little weird, but I, I know I'm sure you guys I embrace know. it. <laughs> I, I embrace it. There you go. Uh, Jimmy yeah, Stanning. I, I was going to say that, that that sounded a little fucking weird. That sounded weird, weird yeah. I made that up. I'll, there I'll you go. Honest. Jimmy's over here. Jimmy, how tall are you, bro? I'm fucking five eight nothing. Five eight coming in at five eight nothing, uh, with some of the best hair and the best beard of the entire fucking team, man. So this guy's awesome. Um, again, super excited to have you on here, brother. Um, I'm really proud me. of you to be able to share your story, man. Uh, you look it. six five on the camera, which is great. I'm so <laughs> right. make me taller. Make me there taller. you go. So, uh, Jimmy, really quick, why don't you introduce yourself, man? Just kind of tell us where you're from. Uh, how many kids you got? Just give us a, a little breakdown as far as like who you are as a father. Okay. Uh, my name is James. Um, I go by Jimmy. Uh, most of the guys know me as Jimmy. Uh, my beautiful fiance calls me James. Um, that's the uh, slave name they call it. Um, I've got four beautiful kids. Um, Adelie and I both had kids before our relationship. Um, Joshua is going to be seven in March. He's my son. Um, Adelie has a daughter named Lily. Uh, she'll be eight in May. Um, so we are a blended family. Um, I love my daughter to death. She is my daughter. Uh, my son is Adelie's son. Um, we have two kids of our own, Leilani, who will be actually just turned three um, on the sixth, or excuse me, the third. Um, and then Lucas will be one years old, the big one coming in at uh, the 23rd of January. Nice. Um, so four beautiful kids. Again, we're a blended family. Um, you know, I, I, that's one of the things that, you know, us and the guys have a, have, you know, big, big in common is the blended family. And, um, it's something that, you know, I embrace to the fullest. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and how old are you? Where are you from? I am 28. Actually, I'll be 28 on the 20th. I'm from oh, nice. Phoenix, Arizona. Um, born and raised. Um, ain't never been anywhere else other than traveling. Um, but yeah, Phoenix, Arizona is where I live in and uh, am from. Awesome, brother. How's the weather out there today? It is. It was 68 and sunny. Can't go nice. wrong. There you three, go. Three months, of, three months of hell in Arizona. And if you can live through that, you deserve to be here. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, and. One of the cool things that you did mention and, and the whole team is we're all blended family. Now, Dad Lives Matter is for all dads. It's not just for blended families. It's not just for for stepdads. It's not time for full-time dads. It's literally for all dads. That's one of the things. Uh, we have followers that follow us that, who, who want to be dads. Yep. You know? And I've, I've even had messages of people that are following us to try to find their dads. You know, wow. they're hoping that their dads are going to be on our, on our, you know, on our TikTok or our podcast, which I think is really cool. Uh, so yeah, we have people that are looking for the dads with us, which is really interesting. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I think we're about 40,000 strong, 40,000 plus strong now uh, within one month. So this has been a great growth. And uh, yeah, it's for all dads. So Jimmy's got a super uh, inspiring story. I think you and I really build a personal relationship because of your story, right? We were, we were to build reliability. Oh, wait, mm -hmm. not reliability. Relatability. Yeah, exactly. It sounds like it's, not, it sounds like it's yeah. not a word, but it's definitely a word. It's definitely a word. <laughs> and if it's not who gives a shit, now it's a word, damn it. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so, um, you know, I was able to share my story and I, I don't want to use any words because I don't want to take away from your story, but I shared a little bit of my story that actually resonated with you. And you reached out to the team. Yeah, that was actually the first day that I uh, got in touch. Yeah. Found yeah. And you showed up uh, every day in the beginning. You were there throwing some positive yeah. vibes. Um, you know, your your comments really stood out to me for some reason. Like, I was like, who is this guy? Uh, we had a team meeting. And I was like, guys, I think I want to bring one more person to the team. And I think it's Jimmy. 
And everybody immediately was like, yeah, for sure. Let's do it. There was no question about it, man. So we're super glad that you're here. Appreciate that. Yeah. I'm, and I'm excited to finish the, the last episode with you. So, you, you know, we can keep going back and forth and all that fun stuff, but let's get into it, man. Uh, I want you to share your story. I know your, your story is very uh, empowering. You know, last time you shared your story, we got some amazing feedback. Uh, you built some amazing relationships. I think a lot of people reached out to you because your story Absolutely. is so impactful, man. So without any further ado, let's let it do what it do. And uh, Jimmy, it's all you, bro. All right. Um, so my story kind of begins in my uh, father's childhood. Um, so I like to, you know, go into where he came from you know, what, what kind of resonated everything in the beginning with him. Um, he was adopted, which I found out early on in my life, um, by, you know, two wonderful grandparents that I had. Um, and, you know, with his childhood, he dealt with a lot of things, including that, you know, being adopted. Um, it, it all really started when he was, I think he was 17, 18 years old. Um, he was, uh, on a camping trip with some buddies, some buddies of his, you know, and then, you know, back in the, in the seventies, I think it was partying and drugs and alcohol. It was, it was, you know, a big part of their lives being teenagers in high school, you know? And, uh, so they're out on the camping trip. And, uh, from what he told me, the story is, is, um, he was, you know, woke up early one morning, jumped in the back of his buddy's uh, pickup truck and decided that he was going to go hunt some rabbits. And, uh, he, he was using a revolver and when he was trailing the rabbit, he said, you know, he was swinging around the rabbit went behind a cactus and there was a big CB radio antenna. And when he swung that, that revolver around, he hit the antenna. And when that happened, it caused the gun to get knocked out of his hands. And he said that he watched it in slow motion, drop to the bed of the truck. And when it landed, it hit the hammer of the, of the revolver. Um, and so with the revolver, as soon as that hammer hits, it immediately fires. Um, and when that happened, the uh, bullet hit him in the groin area, traveled all the way through his, you know, small, large intestines, his stomach. Um, and then the slug ended up getting lodged in his right lung. Oof. All kinds of health, all kinds of health problems, sur countless surgeries later. Um, he, you know, developed depression because of it and carried that throughout his entire life. How old um, is he during that time? I think he was 17 going on 18, mm. uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, mm. But, you know. When, when I was a child, he dealt with a lot of hernias. Um, and back in the day, um, they were, the FDA was like developing this, this thing called the mesh um, material. Oh, yeah, the mesh. Yep, yep. And I, I actually recently uh, saw a documentary about it that it caused all kinds of, you know, dif you know difficult situations for the people that they put it in. And it was actually um, discontinued. Um, so, you know, going back and getting into that story later on, um, I feel like that's kind of, you know, got a lot to do with his, you know, health, major health issues that he dealt with, his, his you know, anxiety, his depression. It all stemmed from something. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I should look I into that. I actually I actually have mesh in me. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah, is yeah. really interesting that you said that because my depression really? didn't come in until after that surgery. Yeah, if you if you can get a chance to um, check out that documentary, I'll try to find it for you and send it yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, he, he uh, like I was saying, he, he developed um, a lot of health issues, um, mental health issues because of it. Um, and, you know, when he met my mother, um, they were together for, I think, five, six years before they even had my sister. Um, she's two years older than I am. Um, so they really had, you know, that time to bond and, you know, do, you know, married couple stuff, go on vacations, go on trips, you know, spend time together. Um, and they built they, they built built um, a very good bond together. So, you know, in the beginning, everything was cool. My dad had a drug addiction throughout that entire relationship, however. Um, and I, I don't remember a time when my dad wasn't on drugs, whether it was cocaine, marijuana. Um, he developed an opiate addiction, which I'll get into. And uh, <clears throat> like it's, I, I never, never saw my dad sober, I, but I, I didn't know, you know, until I was you know, a little older. Yeah. So we moved to Maryville, which is, I call it the Compton of Phoenix because it's, I mean, shots ring out every night, drive-bys, bullets hitting your house. It's a normal thing. Um, and me, you know, being light-complected, my mother is full Mexican. Uh, my dad, 
we never really got an answer at ancestry.com going, but you know, he came to town. He, he, he was, you know, um, it, it, you know, that, that's where I remember growing up. I, we lived there for 13 years back, you know, I we moved there when I was going into kindergarten, mm. um, spent, uh, from kindergarten till seventh grade, um, at the same school, childhood friends going outside playing dad developed relationships with neighbors, you know, my friend's dads, they all, you know, they all kicked it. So everything was normal. My dad had a loving wife, two beautiful kids and myself and my sister who, you know, looked up to him immensely. Um, and probably about 10 years old, I, I, I really started to notice, you know, what my dad's, you know, thing was, you know, he'd get home from work and crack a few beers open and, you know what I mean? He disappeared for a couple hours, which would be in the backyard. And I never really knew what he was doing back there. Um, but uh, it became it, it became routine for him. And, you know, it'd be like 12, 1 in the morning. I'd wake up and he's screaming at my mom, cussing her out, doing all kinds of shit. And Damn. it's, it's uh, you know, it, it, it got tough. So time went on. How old were you about, during this time? 10 years old. So Probably about ten is when I yeah I was about ten when I realized uh, that he had an alcohol problem. You know, back when I was ten years old, I didn't really know what a thirty pack was. You know what I mean? Yeah. I didn't realize yeah. how many of those cans he was drinking. Right, and and um, the reason Jimmy, I'm asking these questions is because I I want our listeners to understand something. And one of the things that 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 I hear often as a father is you can tell your kids all you want, but they more than often they're actually watching what we do more than anything know. exactly yeah, so Absolutely. you're 10 you know what i mean like when you i don't know if, if you're in the same as i am but i remember when i was 10 i felt old you know yeah. like i felt I older know. right I, when mm-hmm. i look at my 10 year old i'm like you're a, you're a baby you're a kid you yeah. right yeah you don't know nothing how, how you know mm-hmm. but you're like no we knew i knew i remember you know yep. you and i have a very very similar story and you're sitting there saying, hey, I remember seeing my dad drunk at one in the morning, cussing my mom out. That's a memory that was imprinted in your head. And this is important because a lot of dads need to understand, like, hey, just because you're, your kid's 10 years old, trust me, they're paying attention. And, and it's exactly, and now you're 27 and you still have that memory in your head. It gets yeah. implanted in there for, for yeah. you know, forever. So, yeah. so you're 10 years old. You're noticing, hey, your dad's got a drinking problem. He's cussing at your mom at one in the morning. He's screaming. You're understanding what's going on. So, so what happens next? Um, he, you know, he disappeared. Like I was saying, he disappeared mm-hmm. for you know an hour or two, sometimes three. Um, and you know, later on in life, I realized that he was in the backyard smoking marijuana. You know, mm-hmm. doing his thing. Um, that was his time. We weren't supposed to bug him. We weren't supposed to follow him out there. I wasn't allowed back there. Um, he had a little shed that he went into. Um, and right around, right around 10 and a half, 11 years old, um, we started going. Actually, it was a little before then. Um, we started going on camping trips um, to Sedona. Mm-hmm. And it was where, you know, most of my bonding happened with my father. Um, fishing, he taught me how to fish, taught me how to build a fire, taught me how to pitch a tent. Um, and those, obviously, mem- those memories obviously outweigh the ones of, you know, He's cussing at my mom. He's drunk. You know what I mean? And I didn't associate him being drunk with the yelling. You know, he was never violent. He never put his hands on my mother. Um, but, you know, sometimes words are worse. Words are very, you know, very much worse than, than yeah. the physical you know, contact. Absolutely. Um, and right around, I want to say 11, he was, he, he was a locksmith by trade. And he was carjacked. Um, in his work van, um, they took him out of the vehicle, hit him in the face with a pair of brass knuckles, mm. and <clears throat> he never worked a day in his life again. They gave him workman's comp. He, you know, soaked up disability, took advantage of the system, you know, unemployment, all that. Mm. He became, you know, what I call the couch potato. He never left the couch. Um, and and it, in in my eyes now, it was the anxiety that was, you know, caused by that situation the fear of going outside, never wanted to leave. Um, it, it was, it was, you know, just kind of developing before my eyes. He was just slowly deteriorating. And um, one of the last camping trips, which was my, my 12th, my 12th birthday. Um, we went out to Sedona. It was the first time that um, we pitched separate tents. 
And let me let me stop you really quick. Yeah. Um, just so the so the listeners know what, what's happening, right? Mm-hmm. So, how often were you guys going camping during this time? Because this is your Every body year. moment. Yeah. Every so year. it all it all started um, with little league. Um, my little league coach, I think I was seven, eight years old. Um, we took a trip with the team. And after that, obviously, I didn't have the same coach the next year. My dad wanted to continue that. We had a great time the first year. Um, awesome. The first time I was there, the whole team was there. All my buddies were there. So it was it was cool. You know what I mean? And um, after that, it became literally an every year thing. Every July, um, we'd go out there. It was summer in Arizona. So we'd, it would be, you know, us escaping the heat. My mom, my sister would make it a girl's, you know, girl's vacation from the guys um and and it was i think five six years in a row we did it and that's awesome um, okay and i just want to make sure because i I know that was a big deal in in your story you know and i want to make sure that the listeners catch that so now we're fast forwarding Mm -hmm. right and now i don't know you don't have to know how old you were but do you have an idea of that time this this part of the Uh, story how old you were about the the last camping trip was when i was 12 12 Um, okay so, so now you're 12. Hopping into them teenage years, I'm, I'm definitely growing, you know, knowledge of everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said, it was the first time that we pitched separate tents. And I went from, you know, seeing my dad come home from work to, you know, a few cans of beers, not realizing how many he was really drinking to mm-hmm. him being home every day because he didn't work and just drowning, drowning himself in everything. Um, and that's one thing I missed is when he did get um, carjacked, he, he was put on opiates. He was put on oxycodone, oxycontin mm. at the same time. And the doctor would prescribe him probably 60 pills each. And he would finish Dang. those in, in less than two weeks. They'd be gone. Dang. And it, it was it was a routine for him. He'd wake up. He'd take two. I'd see him drink like two, three beers. Mm. He'd go outside in that backyard shed. Come back in an hour later, take two more pills, three more. But I didn't know how many he was popping at a time. And then he'd go right back into drinking. Um, and then... It, it'd be, you know, me looking over and my dad's got his head between his legs, slumped on the couch, nodding out with a lit cigarette in his hand, yeah. you know, and, and, and my mom would just be like, you know, one day you're going to burn the house down and, he, you know, wake up. I wasn't falling asleep, you know, so I was I was catching glimpses of, glimpses of all of this mm-hmm. and realizing all right, this this dude's got a problem and my mom don't like it. You know, my mom never really mm-hmm. told me she didn't like it, but I being 12 years old, like you said. Kids know, man. They know. Exactly. And, and the fact that you know, like, uh, this guy's got a problem. You're aware yeah. of that. Right? Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, you're like, hey, mom doesn't like this. So something's going on. Mm-hmm. Something's not right here. You don't know what it is, but you are fully uh-huh. aware that something's wrong. Yep. And that that's a big deal. So now you're about 12. You know, your dad's in this situation where he's addicted, you know, to his medications, you know. And... Um, I was 12 years old, um, going on that last camping trip to Sedona. Um, we, we were, you know, having a good old time. The first time that we ever pitched two tents though. So, um, sorry. This is my fault. All right. No, you're good, bro. <laughs> um, it was the first time that we pitched two separate tents. Um, and that, you know, was a head scratcher for me. It was always, you know, him and I doing our thing. Um, and it kind of, it kind of rang a bell that I didn't, you know, really like, um, yeah. so the day ended our, fir- our first night there, we went fishing, jumped off some cliffs, um, had a good old time. And then, you know, came, came the pitch and tent time and we did it, you know, and it was just kind of like, why, you know? And after we did that, we sat down, started cooking some hot dogs and he broke out a bottle of, uh, 1800 tequila. And when I saw that, I was just like, you know, okay, cool. You know, he's just going to, you know, have a couple drinks, whatever the case may be. That bottle was gone in like 30 minutes. And I'm talking not a small one. It was a standard size bottle of 1800 tequila. Damn. And um, that was the first time that I really saw my father drunk and knew that he was drunk. So, you know, back in the day when I would see him, you know, fit, you know, drinking those beers at night, I didn't know. I didn't relate it. You know what I mean? So yeah, I really, yeah. I really didn't know the difference um, until that night. And I remember feeling like this uneasy feeling of like, and at this camping site, there's neighboring tents. So you, you pay for your site for the week, the day, whatever, whatever the case may be. 
and you're you're sharing that specific campsite with other campers um and they're within you know 10 15 feet of you so i remember my dad stumbling falling tripping the whole nine yards and the the outhouse was probably 20 to 30 feet away and you had to walk through the street to get to it <clears throat> and i was so scared to go to sleep because i didn't want to leave him out there alone you know what I mean? Like he couldn't even hold his balance up around the fire on the tent. So I was just like, man, if this clown goes anywhere, I need to babysit him. You know, 12 years old. What the hell is going on? Dude? Yeah. You know? So I remember he needed he needed to use the bathroom. And then I, I was just going to let him walk his way. And he couldn't even make it like four steps. So I, you know, walked my father to the bathroom. And I remember holding him at the back of his jacket, holding him up so he wouldn't fall and hit his head. And I remember just standing there and thinking, like, what if I let go? You know what I mean? I'm going to see what happens. And I, I remember letting go, and he he had a hat on, and it did one of these against the wall. Damn. And at that Damn. point, I was like, all right, yeah, this is, this is really messed up, you know? So time goes by. We're back, you know, back at the campsite, and it's time to go to bed. I go into my tent. He goes into his, and I'm just laying there staring at the you know ceiling of my tent and i start to smell marijuana and i'm just thinking to myself like you gotta be kidding mind you i'm 12 you gotta be kidding me you know what i mean i know what that smell is i'm not stupid and everything that my father has done at that point has just rushed into my heart rushed into my mind i gotta get out of this tent i gotta go into his and i gotta let him know that this ain't this can't happen no more yeah so, exactly what i did i unzipped my tent unzipped his and i hopped in and instead of jumping down his throat like i wanted to and you know yelling and screaming at him I, I i laid next to him and i put my head on his chest and i told him i know everything i know you have an alcohol problem i know you smoke marijuana i know you take too many of your pills i know you piss my mom off i know it pisses my mom off and i'm scared that my mom's gonna leave you and i don't want to lose you because i i it was one of my biggest fears that my mom would divorce my dad Sorry. And because, I mean, at that time, I didn't know what that meant. You know what I mean? No. Two homes, two this, two that. You know, I didn't, the kids in the neighborhood had their mom and dad. You know what yeah. I mean? Literally all yeah. my friends. So I'm sitting there pouring my heart out to my dad and he's, he's bawling with me. And I asked him that night, please promise me that you'll stop. You'll turn this around. And he promised left and right that he would, that he'd kick it. You know, he'd get himself straight. Um, we ended up leaving, driving back into Phoenix, and it got worse. It didn't change. You, you left that night or the next night? The next night. I told yeah. him I wanted yeah. to leave. <clears throat> I told him I wanted to go home. Yeah. Um, he made me, you know what's crazy is he made me promise that I wouldn't tell my mom about it. Damn. Yeah. He, he didn't want my mom to know that I saw him in that condition. You know, yeah. so he was feeling some type of way about himself, but he was still trying to hide it and still trying to cover, you know, his issues. Yeah. Um, so I immediately got home and, and pulled my mom aside and I told her everything. It, you know, it didn't stop me. And I know my mom to this day is one of the strongest women, woman, you know, I've ever known. Yeah. The, the hell that my father had put her through to the up until that point, you know, I was so scared to tell her but i knew that i had to something told me that i had to um and a after that camping trip we never went again me and my dad never shared that bond um and like i said he just dove deeper into the bottle dove deeper into the pill bottle he was in the backyard more so time went on um little side story the reason that um i ended up moving schools from maryville i was I dealt with a lot of issues on my, you know, my own. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, picked on, bullied. Um, I was a tiny little, tiny little kid. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I got into a lot of trouble as a kid, um, fights. And in seventh grade, um, I remember I was leaving social studies, and this kid was just running his mouth. And I just, I told him, I was like, that's, that's it, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm through with it. And he was probably four feet taller than me, it would have seemed at the time. Um, and he threatened he was going to stab me. And I told him that he didn't have the balls to. So class ends. 
we walk out to the courtyard and the dude sticks it right in my stomach. A little three inch blade. And I dropped to my knees because I couldn't believe it happened. I just see blood look down and the first thing that I thought was to pull your pen out of your pocket and stick it in this dude. Yeah. And so and what's funny is he his mother worked in the library. She was a librarian. So he and what's crazy is my cousin was a music teacher there. And I remember it was such a big ordeal. My mom was so scared to send me back. Um, I ended up getting expelled um, and he got suspended. So it what? was like, it was, a, yeah, it was, it was a crazy ordeal. It was, you know, just all political, you know, like it, it was just all nonsense. Yeah. And my mom was like, well, I wasn't going to send them back anyways. You guys win. Um, so I ended up going to a charter school uh, my eighth grade year. Um, baseball really hit. I was in little league. Baseball really hit my eighth grade year um, when the high school that recruited me came to my eighth grade school. And uh, I started to see my, my father step up a little bit mm -hmm. in that time, but it was more of like golden child thing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like he, he saw, he saw where I was going with baseball and obviously at that point, maybe in his mind, you know, it could, you know, turn him around a little bit, you know, and, but his way of showing it was like, I'm going to buy you the best catcher gear. I'm going to buy you the best equipment. Yeah. And that. But, but I'm not going to show up to your games. I'm not mm. going to go to your practice. I'm not going to, you know, sit and watch you play. I love that. I love that you say that's because this is really, really, really important to the dads that are out there listening. Yeah. There's a lot of truth in what you're saying right now, because a lot of us dads feel like, Oh, I'll just buy you stuff, <laughs> you know? And you're saying something that's yeah. so important. Like it didn't, it didn't fucking matter. You got the nicest stuff at this point. You didn't even say yeah. that. You were like, yeah, he bought me all the nicest stuff. But he wasn't showing up. Exactly. And this is important. This is, I think this is where a lot of us fail. You know what I mean? Like, we don't show up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I know I can get better at that. Absolutely. You know? like any, right? Like, all of us dads who want to be the best dads know that we make mistakes. Mm -hmm. But the biggest mistake that I watch is the dads don't show up. You know? Yeah. And I love that you, you highlighted that indirectly because it is important. This is very important. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. You have the best damn kicks. If your dad yeah. can't see you running with those damn kicks, it doesn't matter. Yeah, <laughs> you, it know? Doesn't matter. you know, you know, what's crazy is what it did to me is, is it gave me not a sense of entitlement, but a sense of like, quote unquote, F you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I'm going to show you what it means to me at one point. And, yeah. and one night I did, we, we had gotten into it pretty bad. I had to have been maybe 14. And he had just spent like six, seven hundred dollars on some brand new catcher get, gear for me. Um, and we got into it and I, I basically picked up every single piece of equipment that he that he got me and I sat it on the couch next to him. Boom. That's where he lived, that that couch. And I told him, you know what, I don't even want this stuff. So yeah. what, my dad, I've never seen my dad explode the way he did. He was he kicked my door down in my bedroom and, and it, grabbed me by my neck, picked up, slams the, the closet door, and instead of hitting me, he hit my solid wood door mm. and broke all of his knuckles. And in a way, I knew that he was mad at himself. You know what I mean? He wasn't I, – I mean, I would hope so. You know what I mean? Like, I don't I don't want you to be mad at me for doing it because you, you basically did this to me mm -hmm. in a way to do to yourself. I, I felt like I really needed to show him that I don't really give a shit about this stuff. Yeah. You know? I don't remember what we were fighting about, but I felt like that point would have been valid. You know? Yeah. 100. Looking back, looking back, like if my son did that stuff to me, <laughs> I'd be pretty mad, but yeah, there was a lot, there was a lot behind it. Right. And so high school goes on. Um, I moved schools again because of baseball. Um, when I was 17, my, my senior year of high school, I went to a different high school and I ended up moving out of the house. Uh, I moved in with a girlfriend at the time. And in a way that was me escaping my father's hell because whoever lived in that house was living it, living his hell, looking over, not, you know, not seeing him because he's asleep in the bathroom, falling, fall, falling asleep, you know, going to the bathroom literally find him with his head between his his legs on the toilet and falling asleep with his lit cigarettes one day you're gonna burn the house down yeah 
and it was in a way it was me just getting the hell out of there my sister was still living there my mom obviously and i didn't check in for probably my whole entire senior year of high school i didn't check in maybe once or twice with my mother go say hi but i was just mia and um that made me grow up pretty quickly just being out of the house and i didn't i didn't really you know run run away from home but i was escaping it you know um and during that year, I got two very, you know, hard phone calls that uh, the first one was that my dad was acting weird. He wasn't waking up. He was lost. He couldn't remember what day it was. So my mom and my sister ended up taking him to the hospital and they found out that he was ODing on his medication. Damn. And yet your sister was living there at the time you were out. How old was your sister during this time? Uh, so she would have been 19 going on 20. She's older. Uh, She's older, yeah, two years okay. older than I am. Okay, got it. Um, she was she was getting into uh, U of A at the time, nice. working on scholarships, nice. um, working part time, trying to get things together for herself, you know, to get the hell out of there as well. Um, and that first phone call really, you know, hit me pretty hard. I didn't I didn't come home. I didn't show any care. I didn't ask how he was. I didn't ask, you know, because I, I it didn't matter to me at that time. Um, so I think it was probably three or four months between. The first phone call and the second and the second one, he was unresponsive on the way to the hospital. At that point, it was just like, all right, he's not going to learn. You know what I mean? I didn't know if my dad was going to be alive in a few hours or if I was going to get, you know, a phone call that he pushed through and he was on his way back home to, you know, do some more drugs. So I made my mind up that, you know, once I graduated, my sister was old enough. She was already, you know, working through getting her college um, scholarships and all that good stuff. So she was already going to move out and me and my sister kind of had a private conversation that we were just going to get my mom the hell out of there. So um, after we, after I graduated, we made the decision and we got a trailer together, told my mom, this is the time we're going to be there. This is the day. And I showed up a couple of my buddies showed up with me. My cousin showed up and we, did exactly that. We got my mom the hell out. And my dad was doing what he does best, sitting on the couch watching it happen. And not not one tear was shed. It was just, you know, in his eyes, it was just furious, you know. Yeah. Um, in, a, in a huge way, my dad was really codependent on my mother, on her, just her presence. You know what I mean? Of course. Of course. It, it supported him for as long as I can remember. And I knew that it was just time. So after we got her things out, um, I made it a point to, you know, like I said, I didn't see my dad that entire year going through two episodes of overdose and I didn't pay him any attention. I didn't ask if he was okay. So I felt the need to really like, let him know like, Hey, this is why I'm doing this. This is why we're getting her out. Um, It has to happen. Um, And I looked him in the eyes. I looked him in the eyes and, and told him that this was either going to make you or break you. You know, um, it's going to take you into a very dark, pli- uh, very dark place, or it's going to, you know, bring you the clarity that you need. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of where everything went downhill. Um, he dove darker into his, you know, despair. Um, I gave him a hug and told him I'd call him the next day and went about my day. Um, so the next day comes around and I give him a call and I ask him how he's doing, you know, what he's thinking about, what he's feeling, what's his plan. And he responded in fury. Again, he was just furious. He was pissed. Um, and 18 years old going on 19, I'm becoming a man. That's one of the most critical times in, you know, a young man's life, especially, when, you know, when he needs his father, you know, he wants his father and he needs that guidance. And I never had that. So I asked him, you know, what his plan was. And he never, he never responded to that question. He just kept telling me that um, he wanted to swallow a bullet. And I, I, you know, let him speak his mind. And I finished with that. You know, you don't have the balls to. You don't have the balls to do it. I didn't know what else to tell him. I, I was just 
thinking to myself, how dare you tell your own son this? What are you thinking? You know, um, of course. And uh, that was the last time I spoke to him. He uh, wouldn't pick up my phone calls after that. I called him maybe two times after that and then finally gave up. So I'd get, you know, phone calls from friends, family, you know, seeing him walk to and from the market, gallon of milk, whatever the case, because my mom obviously needed the, the vehicle and she gave him the house and I knew my father had no source of income other than the government, you know? So mm -hmm. picture my father, I would just literally see him staring at a blank screen on the TV, sitting on that lonely ass couch that he loved so much. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was difficult. It, it, it was to the point where, all right, you got to stop thinking about this and just move on. Never, never called him, but maybe twice. Um, and, uh, it, it you know to this day it sucks you know so i get my life started i'm turning 20 two years have gone by since i spoke to him last and um i find out that i'm having a son i start contemplating calling him again you know really trying to push to get a hold of him maybe you know letting him know that he's going to be a grandfather will change him you know change something's got to change this man um so i think i sat and contemplated it for about four or five days and finally got enough courage to do it. So I gave him a call and I got the, uh, that message that, uh, this call cannot be completed is dialed. So I, you know, took a book, a big gulp and kind of told myself, all right, well, he blocked your number. He doesn't want anything to do with you. And that's that push it out the way. Move on. Um, that same year, November comes around. My family always rents a house um, for Thanksgiving gathering. And um, everything's getting, you know, prepared. Mom, sister at the house getting ready. I'm already at the house, you know, chilling with my cousins. And one of them asked me to go pick up my other cousin from the airport. So I ended up taking that drive alone. Um, I'm 10 minutes into my drive. And I get a phone call from an unknown number. And at the time I was selling vehicles. So that wasn't abnormal to me. Um, it was a Scottsdale area code. So again, it wasn't, it wasn't abnormal. I answer and a, a lady, I wish I could remember her name, um, but I can't. Uh, she says that she's with Scottsdale police department. Um, if I'm standing, I should sit down. If I'm driving, uh, I, I definitely need to pull over. And me being who I was at that time, I was like, just just tell me what's going on. You know what I mean? And she proceeds to tell me that my father was found during a wellness check uh, with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. And he was deceased. And I found the next closest driveway, pulled into it, and told her that I had to get off the phone because I had to call my mother. And that was probably the hardest moment in my life yeah um it, it it i didn't know what to think it was thanksgiving morning you know um i i was just lost i called my mom and i told her hey my uh my dad's dead she didn't ask how because she knew she didn't ask why because she knew um apparently my sister was getting out of the shower at that time when she walked out the bathroom. Um, I guess my mother gave her a look and she already knew she knew immediately and dropped to her knees. Um, and it's crazy because if my family wasn't out here that weekend, I probably wouldn't have been able to get through it, you know? And I, and I mean that support wise, you know, I don't know what I would have done if they weren't there. So my mom tells me to turn around, go back to the house um, she'll let my aunt know that, you know, my cousin needs to be picked up, needs a different ride. Um, so that's what I did. I went back to the house and uh, my cousin, Mike, real, real huge uh, father figure in my life. I look up to the man dearly. And he was the first one because I, he's the one that I called back at that house. And I told him just like I told my mom, hey, my, my dad's dead. And I get back. And I'll never forget the hug he gave me. A day in my life will never go by where I don't think about it. 
Um, it was the most amazing hug ever. Um, after, you know, the family gave me their condolences, I walked out to the, the balcony that, that, that house had. And I remember sitting there, um, and just talking to him. I don't, I don't really remember what I said, but I just remember feeling him right next to me, like more than ever, even when he, and it was a sense of clarity, but also it, it left a huge hole in my heart. And, um, after that, I, you know, obviously my sister and I were the ones that the detectives had to contact, um, my sister, my mom being divorced, they didn't, you know, touch base with her at all. So they asked us to uh, go to the apartment that he was living in where it happened and to go through his belongings, whatever wanted to be kept, we kept, or it would be thrown away. Um, and one of the things that I really wanted was obviously closure. Um, so we found out that he sent a letter to the doctor that he was seeing. Um, and when he sent it, I believe it was Saturday afternoon. So the mail obviously doesn't get delivered on Sundays. So they didn't get it until Monday. And by then he had already done it. Um, we get to the apartment. And one thing that my sister stressed on was if, you know, the mess was going to be cleaned up. Is there going to be any rem remnants of, you know, the, the action? And the detective reassured us that everything was gone. Um, and I remember walking into that apartment and just seeing how my father was living mm -hmm. at that time. It was a studio apartment, perfect for him, you know, and it had his name written all over it. He had major OCD, um, you know, I kept it very well, you know, well put together, clean, just like he liked it. Yeah. Um, atmosphere was so thick and, but, you know, I just, I just didn't know what to do at that point so we just go through his things uh you know find what we could um and i came across a cricket bill uh, which is now metro pcs which for and, people don't know that it's a different cell phone provider uh i pick up this piece of paper and you know i'm just going through it and find out that he changed his number the day before i called him to let him know that he was going to be a grandfather and that that's kind of where it really began to get really tough to deal with, you know, just all the what ifs, all the unanswered questions he left me with the whys, you know, the hows, how am I gonna deal with this? I could have saved his life, you know, um, and that, that's, that's definitely a tough place to be because here's the thing I, I can't relate. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I can only imagine the amount of questions that at that point you ask yourself, what if I would have done this? What if I did this? Could I have done this? Would this have happened? Would this is this and this and this and this? You're going back and forth. You're going back and forth. You're going back and forth. And one thing I learned from uh, one of our followers, Lauren, where her um, husband committed suicide. He committed suicide during the one moment that she left him home alone for an hour. Wow. And yeah, it's crazy, man. She's got a crazy story. And one thing she said is there was nothing she could have done. Yeah. Because once, once someone makes up their mind, that's it. that's it, man. Like the only help is professional help at that point. Like there really, there really is it nothing. And that's gotta be a tough position to be in, man. You know what I mean? And, and yeah. obviously like fast forward now, like, you're talking about your story. You're sharing your story. Like, this is impactful. Um, yeah. One of the things that I really wanted answered was the toxicology screening. Mm -hmm. Medical examiner. I wanted to know exactly what was in my father's system. You know, was he on harder drugs? Did he get into heroin? You know, me and my sister found a, a mugshot that happened uh, during the two years that I didn't talk to him. And he was gone in that photo. It, that wasn't my dad. Yeah. It wasn't him anymore. So I was really bent on just getting that answer. Um, next day we met a detective and another thing that I was really pressed on was, you know, I needed photos. I didn't believe my dad was dead. Yeah. Something in me couldn't believe it. I was having dreams 
those two nights after it happened, you know, that he, he faked his death. I'd be in the line at McDonald's or the, the bank, you know, and I'd finish at the counter and I'd turn around and he's standing right behind me, still alive, telling me why he faked his death or why he did it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it just ate at me. And detective and my sister both refused, you know, to, to show me what I wanted to see. Yeah. Which, you know, and which one? Uh, you broke out, which one? Which, which was understandable. Of course. So, um, I think a week went by before the talk screening came back. Um, she called me and told me that my father was completely sober. There wasn't a lick of anything in his system, not even alcohol, which, you know, I would have thought brought closure, but it just brought more questions that couldn't be answered. Yeah. You know, and uh, it, it, it was tough after that. It, it brought, you know, mental health, I never experienced, you know, I never, I've always, I was that type of person that, you know, didn't believe depression was real. I always felt like I could control my brain. And, you know, if I was in a funk, I could kick it really quickly, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but it sent me in a spiral that, you know, I, I am just now, this was in 2013, 2021's here. And I'm just now barely, you know, getting, you know, yeah. a hold. Yeah. And, and uh, one, thing, one thing that brought me to Dad Lives Matter is that topic of suicide. Mm -hmm. um, first live that I came across was you speaking about your your bad day that you had. Yeah, yeah, I was contemplating suicide, and uh, I I was locked in, brother. I mm -hmm. I didn't scroll, I didn't do anything but follow, and just mm -hmm. jump right in, and and you know immediately got support. Nobody knew my story at that point. Not even you. I did not. Um, no idea your story. So, you know, this is that, it. We brought you, we brought you onto the team before we even heard your story, which is crazy. Yeah, yeah that's great. And then that, that's one thing about the team too, is with Juan and Luna, I, I thought those were lifelong buddies of yours. You guys had mm -hmm. that bond. Yeah. You know? And it, it, I thought you guys knew each other forever. And Me too. I thought, I thought you guys were like, you know, known each other for a long time when one told me no we've known each other for a couple of weeks and like really not not even a couple of weeks i think we've known each other for a week yeah. <laughs> like literally we built a team and then two days later we brought you on wow yeah and it, it we all knew each other right away yeah. right away it but it feels them. like that right like we're yeah. we feel like that and, and the reason why we talk about this is because dads we don't we don't have a lot of other dad friends for some reason you know what i mean and it, this is why it's important for us to find other dad friends you know because we, we relate and we realize like oh man we're a lot in common we go through a lot of the same struggles and you know um this is something that i preach this is one of the things that we we started dad lives matter is for that reason to create a platform where dads can connect and meet other dads right i mean frederick you're all the way in new york Right? Like, what time is it where you're at right now? Uh, right now is uh, 12.54 a.m. There you go. So what's today? Thursday? It's already Friday where you're at, bro. So we're <laughs> talking to Frederick in fr on a Friday. <laughs> and it's Thursday yeah. over here. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, that's well, crazy. Tell, but <laughs> you know what, what you said is right. What you said is right. We don't have a lot of dad's friends. Like Exactly. You know, my close group of friends, uh, because of our age, I'm 34 years old. Mm -hmm. um, I'm... I'm between the youngest on my on my core group of friends, uh, we are all dads, mm -hmm. uh, but because we are all Hispanic, we don't talk about the the stuff that we go through as dads. Of course, uh, especially in we, our culture, we we are thought from a very early age that you have a problem, walk it off. Exactly. Exactly. You're, you're a man. Your job is to deal with the problem. Yeah. Not only um, walk it up, but suck it up. Exactly. You know, get over your shit. Um, Period. Don't be a little bitch, right? That's, but that's, that's li li yeah. literally, and, and that was my mentality for a long time. That, bro, that was all our mentalities. And that's the thing that people don't realize. Like, like I'm, I'm actually embarrassed now to say yeah. that was my mentality as well. It was like, you're being a bitch. Get over it. And, and, and that's something Jimmy said that, that really hit me hard. Because I was the same way. 
Bro, I kid you not, guys. As you guys know, like I had my suicide episode. I've, I'm fighting depression. I'm fighting anxiety. I'm on medication now. I go through therapy. I go through counseling. I don't give a fuck. I tell everybody exactly the struggles that I'm going through, right? Yeah. But if you were to fast forward or rewind, excuse me, only three years ago, I had posted a Facebook message saying depression is a weak state of mind. Wow. That's crazy, right? Because I was just like you said it, like I thought like you were saying like, bro, I can kick it. Not, not even worried yeah. about it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And yeah. then when depression really hit me, when it knocked at my door and kicked down the fucking door and said, hey, punk, this is yeah. a real I was but like, Ooh, here's, here's the fucked up, the, the messed up thing. I used to tell my, my wife, like, she used to tell, tell me about her friends and uh, friends mm-hmm. that, that dealt with it. Tell me, oh, that's such an American yeah. thing. Yeah, it's a even white though, thing. Even though, even though she's, <laughs> she, her, her parents are, are Dominican as well. Uh-huh. She was uh, brought up here among white people. Yeah. So she she's you know she's very sweet, very loving. She cares yeah. about everybody. Yeah. Um. And 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 we can say that in this episode, Frederick. We can't be scared about it, right? Like <laughs> we have a lot of friends that are white. We have a lot of followers that are black. We have a lot of followers yeah, that are Hispanic. Yeah. But but that's that is a thing in our culture. In our in culture, the Hispanic is, land culture, we say that like that's a white person thing. Like we don't have yeah, depression. In depression. Our a teenager with the, dealing mm-hmm. with depression. No way, bro. That's not your a life. Thing. Your life. How hard can your life be? Exactly. You don't have and any bills. <laughs> I didn't recognize what depression was. Mm-hmm. Not only not only when it hit me, was until after I seeked help mm-hmm. and I got into therapy. Yeah. That's when I realized that I've been dealing with anxiety and depression forever. Mm-hmm. Um, exactly. Forever. I love that you said that because then you're aware like, Oh, that's yeah. what this is. Cause we are not that, thought um, what it is. And, mm-hmm. and, and we are thought that if, if you, if you have a moment of weakness, you have to, you know, Grow up here. Exactly. And move on. Deal with it. Exactly. I used to tell friends of mine, which, uh, this is something that, I, that I'm extremely ashamed of. Every time they will come in, they tell me like, no, I'm dealing with this. I'm really stressed out. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, stop being a little bitch. Bro, this is, me this too. Is what you got to do. Yeah. And I'm, I, I was, I'm ashamed of it. Uh, me too. Whatever I said, I was super ashamed of it. And my friends too. I'd, and this is, this is the worst part, bro. I would be like, go for a run. Change yeah. your group of friends, right? Like, go listen to music. You'll be fine. <laughs> sleep yeah. it off. That was my other favorite one. <laughs> sleep it off, right? Like, like, oh, yeah, I'll just fucking sleep it off, you know? And unless you really have gone through depression, you cannot understand it. And, and, and there's an importance, and this is one thing that I learned. There is a big difference between depression and having a bad quarter, going through some bad <laughs> yeah. times, right? Yeah. Like, you go through some bad times, you go for a run, you're going to feel better and it's fine. It's done. Yep. But there's depression on the other side that you've never even touched. Like that, that guy, we don't, that's going to be a whole different episode. You know what I mean? But the reality of depression, anxiety, mental illness is that if you, and, and I hope this doesn't sound wrong, bro, but if you don't fix it, these are the outcomes. It really is. Yeah, right? It really is. You're going to end up taking your own life. To, to touch, that's what I was going to say, to touch yeah. on what you mean in that culture to, you know, bury it and fucking put it to the side and mm-hmm. it doesn't exist or it's, you know, that that's dangerous shit right there. It is dangerous shit. And, Very. and one of the reasons that I started Dad Lives <laughs> Matter is because during the time that I was going through depression, this is before the incident, mm-hmm. I was going through depression. My cousin was going through depression. This was two years ago. And he reached out to the family for help. And guess what? Didn't get it. No, no. We'll pray. We'll pray for you. They said, you know, and then two weeks later, he committed suicide. He ended up hanging himself. He was an older. My cousin was older. He's a couple. He's like five years older than I was. He's got kids. And I want to, I want to emphasize on that because he's a great dad. He was there with his kids. His kids loved him. You know, he was a good dad. His kids went to school. You know, he wasn't involved. My cousin wasn't involved with drugs. He wasn't involved with doing bad things. But depression got him and he didn't get help. And the reason I'm saying that is because you can be on one side of the spectrum where you're like, oh, like this guy was an alcoholic. This guy was a drunk. This guy did drugs. 
you know, um, he cheated on his wife, all these things, right? You, you can go yeah. down and be like, that's why he committed suicide. And then you got this other person that didn't do that and they still committed suicide. It doesn't matter, right? Depression doesn't care who the fuck you are, right? It, it does, there's no color. There's no race. There's no nationality. There's no fucking age. Excuse my language. There's no effing age. Depression doesn't care. And this is why it's important for us to talk about it. This is why Dad Lives Matter is so important because we're like, hey, let's talk about this stuff. Not let, let, let's not just focus on depression and anxiety. Let's talk about how we feel as men. Let, let me ask you this, Jimmy. Since, since we've met, this is probably the third time that you've shared your story now. Yeah. How do you feel every time you share your story? Do you feel better? Is there more clarity? Like, what is it? Absolutely. I, I feel an incredible weight come off of me every time. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I've told you, the first time that I told it was the first time that I told it in a series mm -hmm. of events every day. And every time it, it helps me, it helps me get yeah. the weight off. It's, it's, it's one thing, you know, one thing that it did to me, the situation with my father is create an anger inside of me that I've never, and I'd take it out on my kids. I'd take it out on my woman. I'd call her out her name. Yeah. Respectful words. You know what I mean? Something that I would beat the hell out of some dude if they called my woman that. You know yeah. what I mean? Of course. I grew up hearing it from my father to my mom. You know? Yeah. And, it, it, was, you know? It, was, it was normal for you. Right. Exactly. So we're, we're a product of our environment. Yeah. It absolutely. All, it all stemmed from that. And like I said, I, I didn't believe in depression before this. And when I finally felt it, it was me just trying to kick it, trying to kick it, trying to get rid of it, trying to dump it, not seeking help. Till the day that I did get help, I was just like, damn, like that. I was in a dangerous spot. And yeah. even, even after getting help, I still was making bad choices. I yeah. fear was and still is, and I'm learning, but becoming my father. Mm -hmm. You know, what I've, I've been told that I'm going to check out just like him from people that mm -hmm. I thought I'm going to swallow a bullet. Today's a mm. good day to swallow a bullet. You know what I mean? Gosh, and it's, dang. All right. You know what I mean? And and no. the strength I have now, I've sat, you know, battling drug addiction. I've yeah. hid, hid drugs from my woman. I've hid drugs from my mm. kids. My dad did. And, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm probably, I'm probably six months, not even clean. You know what I mean? Six yeah. months true, true to myself because that's what I got to be true to yeah, first that with my kids and my lady yeah and it got to the point where let's you know, stop you there really quick let's stop you there really quick yeah. sorry yeah. let's just celebrate the fact that you've been sober this long first yeah, yeah. that's important yeah man like that let's and and you know again not being rude but let's we got to celebrate those wins brother you know what i mean like that's huge man that's huge yeah. like you're sober you know like obviously your relationship is getting better I'm mm -hmm. sure you as a father is becoming better. All of a sudden you're in dad lives matter. Now you're part of the group. Now you're out here sharing your story. Now you're on a podcast sharing your story. Yeah. Like this is awesome, man. <laughs> like these are huge wins. Yeah. Listen, um, you're on a winning fucking streak. Absolutely. Today's a fight, man. Every it is. It is a fight. And that's the thing too, man. Like I tell people like, just because I am dad lives matter, right? Like I, I started dad lives matter, whatever. Dude, I have every, yeah, you know that. I talk to you guys yeah. all the time. Bro, I had a down day today. I thought I was going to fall yeah. apart, right? Oh, this podcast was supposed to be yesterday. Yeah. Right? It <laughs> yeah. wasn't supposed to be today, right, guys? <laughs> this was supposed to be yesterday, and I had a bad day. And I was like, hey, guys, I'm not I'm not in it today. I got it. I'm done. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't feel good. I'm just going to have to lay this one out. And my yeah. point is, we all have bad days. And I love, Jimmy, you say this all the time, and, and I've actually taken this from you. Yeah. It's okay not to be okay. Exactly. Right. I, I, I love that. I was gonna bring that up, uh, that uh, Jimmy, because mm -hmm. I, I heard it. I heard it. Uh, I'm I'm so bad on on jumping on the live. Um, <laughs> I'm terrible at it. I'm not. I'm I'm, I'm not gonna make any, ex any excuses. Uh, but I did catch that uh, for the few minutes that I was in. When you yeah. said it's it's okay not to be okay sometimes. Yeah, and and it it takes so much courage to 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 not to say it and to leave it exactly. Um, because 
a lot of a lot of men and women a lot of people mm-hmm. they they see having a bad day and and, and just saying no nah, this was too rough i'm gonna i'm gonna stop take a shower and go to bed and restart mm-hmm. tomorrow mm-hmm. they see that as, as a sign of weakness um, yeah. i'm guilty of it mm-hmm. i know a lot of a lot of you both of you are as well Mm-hmm. especially when when you are responsible for a family oh yeah you don't want to stop um but that's that's such a that was such a such a great a great message and yeah, i was I so happy message. on the group message when jimmy told you to take a day off yeah so, man i was happy too like i was like dude you guys we need those days off it's okay absolutely not to be okay sometimes you need to recalibrate yourself and just reset and then guess what today i went for a run i feel great i'm back on my mood and now we're doing this podcast and we're finishing it strong you know what i mean yeah. if, if, and, and that, that works out so we can keep going back and forth um jimmy your story is impactful man um i'm so proud of you bro like honestly man like For those of you guys who don't know and who are listening to this podcast, uh, we have Luna, we had Quan, and we have Jimmy. We, none of us have actually, you know, we got Frederick on here as well. Uh, he's like my co-host. He just doesn't know it yet, but he's my co-host. <laughs> hey, honestly, Fred- I try not to interrupt. I try not to talk because I, I want I want this about to be about uh, the two, the whoever, whoever is, 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 is in the podcast and you, yeah, Frederick, every podcast that we start, Frederick goes, I'm not going to jump in. I'm not going to interrupt. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> every time he jumps in every See? time. So I'm like, Frederick, I, you're, I, just admit you're the co-host. Bro. I didn't, I didn't tell that to Jimmy though. <laughs> yeah, no, you I didn't. Him, you didn't I tell him that that to I Jimmy. Wanna, I want to jump yeah. in. I'm going to interject <laughs> here and there. Yeah. Cause it's, it's hard. It's hard not to. Of course. Um, of course. You guys, you guys is, um, You, all, all three of you, all four of you have given me so much perspective. Yeah. And so, this is only four stories. So imagine how yeah. many more stories we got to share yeah. with people. The world. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. I made, right? it, I made it in my mission, man. After, you know, dealing with what I dealt with. Let's save some lives. Let's do yeah. it. But that's important. <laughs> yeah. Sharing sharing what you, what you are doing right now is mm-hmm. so, so so important exactly i i lost a friend not too long ago he took his own his own life Mm -hmm. and um this was someone that you know we were in we knew each other for a short period of time but we basically spent almost every day talking Mm -hmm. because he he worked on a place right next to where i used to work So every time I step outside for 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 a vape, uh, he was stepping outside for a cigarette. Uh, he will come in, uh, you know, to sit at the bar for a little bit during his breaks or after he was done with his job. And someone that, w- that we got to talk a lot. You know, I mean, I, I, I was a smoker for a long time. I had my last cigarette when my daughter Abigail was born. That was the day I said, you know what? I'm done. I'm done with nice. cigarettes. Um, but when you're a smoker, you you step outside, you see another smoker, you end up talking, mm-hmm. and slowly you build a relationship with that person. And he was someone that was struggling with drug addiction, um, lots of issues. And you know, I I we gave him as much support as as we could, as he let us. Um, give him, but. The 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 thing is, he refused to 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 go into into that. He would say, no, "I'm just having a rough day." He he wouldn't he wouldn't mm-hmm. open up. Of course, and it's so important to open up. And because, for example, your story, Jimmy, uh, and and Luna's and 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 Juan's and Fernie's, hearing somebody going through what you guys have been through can help someone say, "You know what? I'm having a rough." But this guy had it 10 times worse than I than I did. And they're still here. They're still strong. And they're trying to do better and better every day. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Exactly. And then you get the, like Juan was saying, or uh, Jimmy was saying, the relatability. You know, exactly. we're able to 
relate with each other and, yeah. and help each other, support each other. Like uh, when I heard Jimmy tell this story the first time, I mean, you were having a hard time sharing your story, man. You know, like you were choking up, you were in yeah. tears, like it was hard. But you're right. Like now that I've heard this a third time, I can see the weight has really just come off your shoulder. You're more clear with your message. You're more clear with your story. You're like one in one with this message now and you're, and you're aware of it. And now yeah. it's getting to the point where you're like, Hey, let's save lives. And that's awesome, man. And so I can go back and forth. I know we can go back and forth, back and forth, but we want to keep these episodes to like an hour, maybe a little more, but yeah. I, I want to ask you something, brother. And this is going to be a left. I'm going to hit, I'm going to hit you from the left really quick. And not to throw you off, but this is a really important question. I, I want to start asking all my listeners. <sighs> You're 27 right now. Yep. And how old were you when your dad committed suicide? Uh, I was 20. 20. Okay. So if the 27 year old you now, sober Jimmy, dad Jimmy, dad lives matter Jimmy, right now mm -hmm. can go back to that 20 year old you during that time, bro. Yeah. And you can give yourself advice. If you can hug yourself and be there for you, what would you say to yourself? Um, damn, bro. <laughs> I would definitely look myself in the eyes and let myself know that uh, he he put him on he put it on himself. You know, this isn't your fault. You know, stop, take a deep breath, regroup, and just know that he's okay. He's at peace. He's gone, but he's not. And everything's going to be okay, man. He's closer to you than ever now. There you go. You know, and obviously take it one step and one day at a time, just know that your answers will never be answered. Or, I mean, your questions will never be answered, but that's okay. And one thing that I dealt with was forgiveness. And brother Luna said it best, man. Forgiveness is release. Mm -hmm. Moment that it's, I feel it's for your peace. Exactly. And the moment I feel like I released and forgave him was on the live when I first shared it in front of people. I, I agree with you. I felt that energy. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm saying I agree with you because I could see that energy. Yeah. And that, that question's what's that? Like I said, I told you guys after after that live, man, I jumped on and I was just like, and, and to this day, I mean, it was what a week ago when it happened. I mm -hmm. don't single word I said on that live. I prayed. <laughs> I went on. Yeah. God, to let it flow off my tongue like you want. Yeah. You know, let this touch as many lives as you want it to in a way. That you do. And and that's exactly what it did, man. The yeah. amount of feedback I got and the amount of love that I got and support. It was, it was awesome. Yeah, it was a awesome, lot. man. And that's this is why it's so important that we share a story. This is why it's so important. This is why your story is important. This is why Frederick's are important. This is why my story is important. This is why everyone's story is important because you don't know who you're going to touch. Right? Right. You don't know who's going to relate to you. You don't know who's going to change what life, whose life you're going to save. And the reason why I think that question is so important, if you can go back to yourself and give yourself one thing of advice is because someone out there is going through what you went through. Absolutely. And they need to hear that because yep. they, they don't have that. Right. So imagine someone right now is going through what 20 year old Jimmy went through. Yeah. So you can imagine how impactful this message can be. Because Absolutely. this is probably something what you needed to hear at that very moment. Hands, hands down. Yeah. So, Frederick, do you got anything else to say before we wrap this awesome podcast episode up? No, man. Uh, I'm basically just going to tell you that you guys are so you guys are so strong. So you guys are, you guys are really amazing. Um. Like I told you earlier, you guys, you guys have given me so much perspective, and 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 you you you're a warrior. Well, you're a warrior. Uh, just dealing with everything that you dealt with, and 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 just keep trying to do better, not only for you but for your family, mm -hmm. is, is is so admirable. 
um, like Fernie said earlier, it's not provide. It's not only providing monetarily to your family. It's just being there and and trying to to be a good father. Absolutely, is 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 one of the most important things. Is being present. Kids, yeah. kids, they don't they don't remember that you bought them a toy, mm -hmm. that you bought them a pair of shoes, that you bought them a shirt. Kids remember you being there. Mm -hmm. And as as we grow, you you think you when you think back at, at least. I had a rocky relationship with my father. Now we're we're in, in great terms, but for a long time I was I felt nothing but hatred for the guy. Mm. Uh, now we're in a good place, but honestly, what I when I go back to my childhood, that's the only thing I, re I remember. I don't remember all the money that he sent me, mm. uh, all the the stuff that he bought me, because uh, he he lived here and I and I lived in the yard. Mm. Uh, the shipments of, of clothes and toys and and because none of that mattered to me. What mattered right. was, you know, that I saw my friends with praying with their dad. Uh, I and I, I I remember I was like eleven years old, and a, fr a friend of mine is him, his two brothers. And uh, and their dad, they they took me along. They went they went just to 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 play baseball. And I I just I, I had to go. I run I ran home crying. And because why can't I I cannot do this with my father? Yeah. And yeah. and I'm saying this because of what Jimmy said about forgiveness. Yeah. The moment I decided to forgive him, it was like I I. I I, I, this big weight was lifted off my chest. Yeah. Yeah. You don't live with that pain anymore. You let it go. Yeah. Forgiveness it, is for your peace. Exactly. Absolutely. It's not, it's not for yeah. them. No, it's not for the, the person no. that, that, that wronged you. Exactly. Whatever way they did is it's for yourself. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And yeah. you, Jimmy, being able to, to forgive your father, um, It's, it's one of the hardest things to do is to forgive. Yeah, exactly. And, dude, seven years ago isn't that it long ago. That long. <laughs> yeah, that's not that long ago. That's what people have to understand. Like, I lost my father maybe four years ago, five years ago now. I don't even know. And it feels like it was yesterday still. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Seven years is not that long ago. Now, I, I, that's crazy, man. So, um, I just want to say real quick. I'm I'm a firm believer that uh, that everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, Me too. Yeah. And maybe, and this is might might just be me being a little optimistic. Maybe what happened is to help you not to be like like that, to be a better father. Yeah. That's 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 yeah. that's the way I, I I'm I'm looking at it. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. And, and I think that's that's very important that you say that because, um, you know, I've shared this with you guys is the my dad being one of the worst dads, not the worst dads, right? Someone else has the worst dad. My dad was just a total piece of shit. Uh -huh. But I'm so grateful that he was a piece of shit because it made me the best father that I am now because yeah. I know what I'll never put my kids through. Exactly. That's something you had Absolutely. mentioned, right? Like Jimmy, you were like, I was going down that path. I was being like my father yeah. and it wasn't fair for your kids. And now you're sober. And that's Thanks. awesome. Yeah, Thanks. man. It, and that's awesome because you're right. Like it's, it's better now than never. Exactly. Yeah. It's never too late. It's yeah. never too late. Exactly. Absolutely, brother. That's I'm awesome, perfect. man. And you, you go ahead. You're breaking up. I said it's never too late to become the man and woman that you want and need to be. Yeah, I love that. Do you want but to close with anything? I definitely do, man. Um, for one, I want to thank you uh, for what you. That lives matter is the safest place I've ever been. <laughs> the the amount of open arms that I experienced day in and day out with you and yeah. our three, you being included, 
and all the guys that come in on the lives, you know, the ones that, you know, will be on this podcast soon. Mm -hmm. It's, it's one of the safest places for, for all people, man, not just dads, you know, and I hope these podcasts touch the right people, touch all people. Um, and I'm thankful for you, Fernie. I really am, brother. Thank you, brother. That means a lot, man. I really, really appreciate that, brother. Because as time, sometimes it's tough, man. And when you when you get that feedback, it it gives me strength for yeah. myself. So I'm really grateful that you said that. Thank you. Thank you, man. Of course, man. You know, I got nothing but love for you, brother. To to my little brother. Yeah. <laughs> my little time. my little big brother, bro. <laughs> Jimmy, what's uh your social media, man? Where oh can yeah, yeah. Find you? So guys, go ahead and find um, Jimmy on social media. You actually are on a couple uh, social media platforms. So guys, if you have any questions for him, please reach out. Um, Jimmy is very good at reaching out to people. He's very on top of it. He understands how serious uh, his story is, and and you know someone that is in that situation. So he's very very on top of it. He'll text. He'll call. I mean, dude, this guy's taking phone calls with 2% battery on his phone <laughs> when like, his car is getting towed and yeah. he's in the back of a van. <laughs> I didn't make any of this up. This is all true. And he's like, I'm going to take this call because it's important. And, four, and I four, love 4% on this podcast right now. <laughs> uh, 4% on this podcast. So we got to get going. But uh, this is the guy right here. We know we're going to get him for Christmas. So uh, really quick, what's your social media platforms? Uh, let everybody what do you know so we can go ahead and share that uh so you can find me on facebook at jimmy bauer j-i-m-m-y-b-a-u-e-r um and then tiktok at jimmy bauer zero perfect perfect brother and we'll make sure we add those links as well guys uh jimmy thank you bro seriously thank you, brother. Thank you for sharing your story with us man i really really appreciate it frederick thank you for being here with us as well as my favorite hope uh, co-host <laughs> um, My pleasure fucker there you go i love it so with that being said guys uh again thank you for jumping into our our dad lives matter podcast we really appreciate you guys listening uh we got some more stories we got so many more episodes to go we're not going nowhere we've been here one damn month and we're 40k strong and trust me we're going to continue going with this yeah fernie uh i'm gonna ask you because people are asking yes sir what's up with the merch oh. oh yeah we got merch coming guys uh i say we got about two weeks out and then we are fully loaded with merch man uh so, so. i got i got two guys uh they want to know if you're doing hats and hoodies i told them yep. yeah they don't know so we're gonna start off with hats hoodies shirts and decals that's where we're just starting off with that that's that's gonna be the beginning of our start off um so you guys will be getting the website going we're working on the website as we speak just so you guys know there's a lot of back-end stuff that we're really doing jimmy how are we doing on your on your battery three percent we're good brother all right all right so uh <laughs> we will get all that stuff out to you guys i promise uh give me about two weeks and we'll have a website launched we'll have everything set up uh, guys we have followers in the uk we have followers in ireland we have followers in scottsdale we have you know people in canada uh we so have, we want to make sure that our website can host everybody absolutely we had a guy from hawaii on the live today there you go we got guys awesome. from hawaii i'm telling you guys man we are worldwide this is awesome uh dads this is what it is this is this is who we are guys we are dads this is a crazy story check this out before i go so people can understand where we're at we have a dad that was on our live inside of prison. He was in prison on our live. Remember that guy? He was literally you, watching. Our, no, bro, I'm not joking. Check this out. He was in his prison cell watching our live. And in that same live, we had a police officer watching our live. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy, right? <laughs> both <laughs> both dads. They were both dads. Didn't even know they were on the pot. They didn't even realize they were on the live together. But two dads. And that's what that's the one thing that makes us all, you know, the same. We're all dads. It's something we can relate to. So it doesn't matter. Don't, where don't do that. Don't do that with your hands, bro. That is, oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, we're all dads. <laughs> um, listen, real quick. This has my has nothing to do with anything. But uh, a couple of years ago, a movie came out, and I started watching it because it was just on, mm -hmm. and I was bored. 
Uh, it was called What to Expect When You're Expecting. It's like a, like a rom-com. Oh, I love that one. In that one, yeah. That movie, uh, the, the, they have a, a group of dads that they go to the park every day. Uh, I forget yeah. the, the name of the crew. But listen, it, 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 it was played as, as a funny thing that, that dads do that together with the kids. But things like that, I rightly encourage people to do it. Agreed. Like that, just just get a couple of your friends to have kids, bring your kids, and just share. You know, what 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 what's the best way for you to change the diaper, or what cream works yeah. better when, when your kid has a rash? Yeah, stuff like that, man. Try, let, let's exactly. make each other's life easier when it comes exactly. to, to dealing with our kids. I love it. And that's important, man. We got to do it. So, if you haven't seen that movie and you're a dad, highly recommend that you watch that movie. That's a really really good movie. We got merch coming up. Guys, if you're getting any value from these podcasts, do us a huge, huge favor. Subscribe and rate these podcasts, please. It just helps us move this podcast forward. Make sure you share with your friends and family as well. We are down to probably 2% battery time on Jimmy's phone, so we're going to cut this off. We're going to call it a night. Jimmy, thank you again, brother. I really, really appreciate you being on here and sharing your story, bro. Thank you for having me. Before you leave, um, the same day that the the interview, the podcast go live. The video is gonna go live also on uh, on YouTube. Uh, okay. What's the YouTube? What's the YouTube channel, Fernie? Uh, Dad. Period. Lives. Period. Matter. Beautiful. Uh, also to the YouTube channel, subscribe, yes. like the video, mm-hmm. play it. Um, that's uh, the best way we can keep this moving forward, guys. Exactly. All right, guys, we really, really appreciate you guys being here. Jimmy, thank you again, brother. Nothing but love for you, brother. All right, guys, you already know. Love you too, bro. A rato, vato. A rato, vato.